If you flip in your Bibles, we are going to be looking at one verse. Actually, we're going to be looking at a few verses, but one verse specifically that is most likely the most popular verse in the Bible. Out of 31,102 verses in the Bible, there's one verse that often you see at football games or behind home plate at the World Series that some crazy Jesus freak is lifting up. We get to look at John 3.16. We get to look at this verse. And most of us might even know it. In fact, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to invite all of us to say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, not perish. Exactly. Now, you might have said in a different translation, doesn't matter. Right there is the exact and the gospel in one simple verse. This one simple verse has allowed us to see and look at what God has done and brings to us and going, wait, what does this verse mean? Because it's so easy that we can often think, oh, this is the gospel, and it is. But it didn't happen in a vacuum. This verse, as we've seen last week, actually comes right after a conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. We know that Jesus and Nicodemus are coming together and they're speaking in the middle of the night. And in fact, Jesus called him, it called Nicodemus the teacher of Israel in John chapter 3, verse 10. And they're having this entirety of this conversation. And as they have this conversation, it goes from verse 15 that says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. To John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Now, before we get in there, we have some housekeeping that we have to look at because the transition between 15 and 16 has actually been greatly debated among scholars. In fact, some of your Bibles, if you have an NIV and it's a red letter Bible, you'll see that the red letters end right there. If you have an ESV, a New King James, or an uh, NASV, you will see that Jesus' conversation continues. Now, I'm of the opinion that this is a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, and Jesus is preaching about himself. In fact, Dr. Steve Lawson, this is what he says about this passage. He believes that Jesus is continuing to speak as he addresses Nicodemus in the extended discourse that has now become a discourse concerning the new birth. But he also goes on to say, if you don't have that opinion, in either case, if you think it's John giving a commentary on what Jesus said, in any case, it really doesn't matter. In either case, they are equally inspired and equally true. John 3.16 is true. This is what Jesus is saying. He's delivering the good news to the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus. Whoever believes in him, whoever believes. Now, this actually starts to get difficult. Because if you remember Nicodemus, and you start to look at Nicodemus, Nicodemus just had those words hit upon him, the belief in eternal life. And Jesus used the example of the serpent being lifted up and looking upon the serpent, and you will be healed. And he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. This is going along with Jesus telling him that he must be born again. But how do you do that? It's amazing how simple this becomes. When we look at John 3.16, it is simple. You believe in Jesus and you have eternal life. Now, that actually becomes very difficult for us. Has any of us ever struggled with simplicity? Because we can look at Jesus and go, wait, it can't be that easy. 
There's no way that all I have to do is believe in you. And as I believe in you, I have eternal life. And this is really hard for us to fully grasp. And I'm going to tell you, this is extremely hard for Nicodemus to grasp. It's hard to grasp the word of God simply. But did you know that Jesus has commanded us to simply believe? It's interesting. He actually states who he is and the fact of what he says is true in the Sermon on the Mount. He gives us the commandment to simply believe. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, this is what it says. Let what you say be simple, yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. I love this little verse because I like to look at it in context of how God spoke throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. It's a really cool thing because Jesus and the Lord have always simply told people this. They said, I am the Lord. And it was on us. It was on the saints of old to believe in Jesus, to believe what the Lord said. One of my favorite examples is the Lord told Sarah. You remember Abraham and Sarah? Her name was Sarah at the time. And God's like, you're going to have a child. And she's like, I'm old. I can't do that. And she laughed at the Lord. Now, realistically, how hard is that simple statement? You're going to have a child. Well, that's pretty easy. But she laughed at him going, that's impossible. So she actually had a child and named her child after him, after laughter. But it goes even farther. God spoke to Samuel as a little child. Samuel in the Old Testament was a man that was was a child that was given to Eli the priest and raised in the Lord. And God spoke to Samuel. And And Eli, or Samuel was so confused Eli gave him the simple instruction of just listen. Just say your servant is here. We see how simple the Lord speaks to us. But yet even in that, we can be troubled by this verse. Because in this verse, we know that it's it's calling us to believe and telling us that we have eternal life. But we might have questions. You might ask questions like, who is the whoever's? What does it really mean for the the word that? Some of your translations might have the word may in it. Does that mean I can lose my salvation here? Does that mean that God might reject me at this moment? These are questions that we can have. Oftentimes, we'll even look at it and go, what does belief mean? Is that a head thing, a heart thing? And in fact, I've heard preachers say, you must believe, and they'll just use every part of their body. Your big toe must believe in Jesus. That's what this means. What does it really mean? And this is what we get to look at today. We get to look at John 3.16. So let's look at it once again. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now we're going to break this down because it starts with a very powerful conjunction. This conjunction is something that we have to look at because this conjunction brings us from what has just been said, that whoever believes may have eternal life, to moving us forward to something altogether. And this conjunction is saying, for God. I love this. Because this immediately puts the word of God, what Jesus is saying on foundation for God. Oftentimes, we like to defend God. We like to tell God what he means. We like to do all these things. But Jesus sat there and said, I'm going to point to the absolute authority, God. For God. God, when he has something to say, always stands on his authority alone. We know this from Genesis. In the beginning, God. We actually even see this in the desert with Moses. 
Moses is standing in front of the burning bush, and Moses says, who are you? And he says, I am. He gives a very simple answer. This is my authority. Now, it immediately puts us in a position of going, who are you? To actually question this authority from the Lord. Who are you to question God? Because we can't sit there and say, but God. I'm going to tell you, you can try. It's not going to go well for you. It really will not. So God stands on it. So it says, for God. And then one of the great words of this passage, for God, so. Now, many of us just overlook this first, this word. This word so is very important. It's very interesting because in the Greek, it's hoto or hotos. And what this word means is in this manner. So you can actually look at this verse and it says, for God in this manner loved the world. Now, what does that mean? Isn't that weird to actually say it like that because it's, well, that's not how our English works. But this is actually very important for us. Because this answers, this word so answers a question that many of us have had throughout our lives. And that is, why did Jesus have to die on the cross for me? Couldn't God have just saved the world in another way? Have you ever asked that question? I mean, he's God. Couldn't he do whatever he wants? But realistically, this verse tells us differently. This verse tells For God loved you in this manner because this is the perfect manner. He loved you this much because this is the way he chose to do it. And it was the full scope of our sin. The so in here is Jesus loved us in this manner. So we see that. For God loved us, in this, or God in this manner, then we get the word loved. Loved is a beautiful word. For God so loved. Now, this word is agape. Many of us know what that means, and that's that, that self-sacrificial love. But it says God loved, now what is it? The world. He loved the world. Now, right here, this passage had to blow the minds of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel. He is a Pharisee. He is one that knows and understands the history of God and the world. He's read the Old Testament. He knows everything. And now Jesus says, for God so loved the world. Now, I want you to notice, it does not say, for God so loved only Israel. No, it says, for God so loved the world. Now, we see the scope. How did God love us? He loved the entirety of the world. He loved the world. Now, when we really look at that, why would he love the world? That is a great question. Why? And does God only love the world? Does God love me or does he love the world as a whole? The answer is yes and yes. God loves the world because he chose to love you. In fact, we see how God loves the world in many different ways. We actually see that God loves the world in John 3, 16. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we see that God loves the church. Look what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we see that God loves the world. We see that God loves the church, but he gets very personal in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, this is what Jesus says. This is what Paul writes. This is what the Lord says. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life 
I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We actually see in these three passages how God loves us. He loves the world in this broad sense, but he scopes it down even to include you. God loves you. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? God loves you. But this verse even goes farther in John 3.16. It says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him. This is the second time you notice in two verses that the word whoever believes begins. Whoever believes shall have eternal life. Jesus is making this point twice, right in a row. He's saying, if you believe, you will have eternal life. Whoever believes. Now, that's a very simple thing. That puts the onus of this on us. It gets really amazing when we actually think about what this says. It says that God loves us, that all we have to do is believe. Now, this is usually where we have the greater issues. This is where I'm sure that Nicodemus was at a moment of going, wait, what does this mean? Belief seems too easy. Pastor Glenn last week gave a great description of the Pharisees of the time. He gave a description of what, what the, the Pharisees believed and most likely even what Nicodemus believed. And it, and it was, God accepts us for our righteousness. That's what the Pharisees believed. In fact, that's what most of us and most of the world in one point of our lot time believe. We have to do something. We have to go farther than that. We have to live at least semi-holy. If our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, maybe God will accept us. But that's not what this verse says. This verse is this simple. Whoever simply believes. It's not on our righteousness. It's all on Christ. Now, the funny thing is Nicodemus should have known this. Because there's often times that we look at Jesus and there'll be people in our lives and we might even have this view that we go, the Old Testament, that's a God that you got to heaven and God only blessed those based off of them doing the commandments of God. That was a works-based system. In the New Testament, Jesus came and he changed it. That's a, there's a problem there. Does God change? No. This can't be a new revelation. This has to be who God is. Because if God can change, we're in trouble. And God says he doesn't change. So how and why should Nicodemus know that it's not based off of our own righteousness? In fact, he should have known it because it's in the law. It's in Deuteronomy. I don't care if you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee who only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. I don't care what your view is. All Jews agreed on one fundamental basis, and that was the first five books are Scripture. And Jesus goes, let's go back there. Nicodemus should have known, because we can look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 9. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4 God has one of the more powerful statements of who he is. We're going to read through verse 7. It's a long passage, but we're going to read it to see that what God does for us and his righteousness. This is what it says, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thr thrusted them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas 
it is because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord has driven them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess the land. But because of the wickedness of the nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. And that he may confirm the words that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of Egypt until you came to this place, you have rebelled against the Lord. Now, we read that, and in three verses, Jesus, or the Lord said to the people of Israel three times, this is not because of your righteousness. Now, I don't know, have you ever had to tell a child three times to get the point across? And here's God telling all of Israel, not because of your righteousness. Don't even think it's because of you. Because you are horrible. That's my Cliff Notes version of this. Nicodemus should have known this. It's not because of our righteousness. God has never changed. He says that we believe in him and we get eternal life. This this verse can be simply broken down into God, the almighty authority, so loved the world, the mighty motive that he gave his only son, the greatest gift that whoever, the widest welcome, believes in him, the easiest escape, should not perish the divine deliverance, but have eternal life, the priceless possession. This is the passage that we get. This is why John 3.16 is the gospel in one verse. This is why we can sit there and tell our kids right from the beginning, John 3.16. Because we understand this, because this is how God transformed us. But this brings still more questions. Because this verse is not done. Jesus isn't done speaking. It says in verse 17, right after this, it's really interesting because you would think it would just be done, but it's not. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Isn't that an interesting verse? How many of us look at God in this manner? How many of us understand what God is saying in this manner? We look at God as this, almost a God that can throw lightning bolts from heaven. By the way, that is called Zeus, not Yahweh. Okay, so we look at this, but Jesus is sitting there and he goes, wait, hold on. Once again, for God. How many of us have ever spoke for God in judgment? How many of us have ever spoke for God in forgiveness? Jesus is sitting there going, I'm going to let God speak for himself. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus is telling Nicodemus one of the hardest truths we can ever hear. And that is, God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Why is that a hard truth? It's a very difficult truth. It's a very, very difficult truth because how many of us look at the world and say, it's not worth saving? You might have been on your way here and been cut off in traffic and had a time where you did not believe that person should be saved. (laughs) And that's just traffic. 
We have a hard truth with that because we see the world. Could you imagine Nicodemus being there, a teacher of Israel? Rome is invading. They're occupying the land. The Jews are being persecuted. And here's Jesus saying, Jesus, I came into the world to save the world, not condemn it. He's like, can you condemn Rome? Jesus is like, no. I didn't come here to condemn. He came to save. This is an amazing verse. But it's also a really interesting one. Because as he says it, it's in order that he might save through him. In this verse, Jesus does make it exclusive. You notice it doesn't say, for God so loved the world, that whoever believes in God will be saved. No, he says, in him. He points to one way, and one way alone, and that is through Jesus Christ. Later in John, we get to go over John 14, 3, which is in another amazing verse, and we might even know this one. But John 14, 3, this is what it says. It says, Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to me except through the Father. We see that Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But what does that mean for the rest of the world? What does that mean for all of humanity? What does that mean if Jesus is the only way? Doesn't that mean that God is sending people to hell if they don't believe in him? Well, look at the next verse. Jesus has an answer for your question. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, I want you to dwell on that verse. Whoever believes is not condemned. We already got that. Why? Jesus already told us. He stood on the authority of God. But who does not believe is condemned already. Now, many people have have dissected this verse in such a way that it's like, okay, what does this mean for those that are condemned and those are not condemned and all this kind of craziness? But you want to know something about the Word of God? It's the best way to understand the Word of God. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. You want to know why? Because it's God speaking to us. So what does it mean for those who are already condemned? Now, there's another really famous verse. I love this because I just chose every famous verse in the Bible, and I was like, we're just going to go over them all. Romans 3, 23. Now, how many of us know Romans 3, 23? If you are in Awanas, you know this. Here you go, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many of us knew that verse? Put your hands down, stop bragging. (laughs) For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that makes a lot of sense, right? Isn't it amazing that right in this very verse, it tells us that those who do not believe are already condemned. Why? Because they've already sinned. And they've already fell short of the glory of God. But yet, in this, we can struggle with this moment. We can sit there and go, wait, Jesus, all I have to do is believe and I'm not condemned? Could you imagine Nicodemus sitting there? Could you imagine him sitting there and going, this is way too easy. David Guzik actually writes about this. He says, Jesus came to bring salvation, but those who reject that salvation condemn themselves. We never need to leave the reason for anyone's condemnation at God's door. The responsibility is theirs alone. This is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. But it still brings questions. And Jesus still goes on. Look what it says 
as Jesus continues on in verse 19. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. If anyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. We look at the harsh, the harsh truth of going, if it's this easy, why would somebody reject Jesus? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever looked at somebody that's, that's just falling in their sin? And you want to look at them and say, it's not that hard. Turn your life to Jesus. And you might be as bold as, as I am and actually say that. This isn't hard, not rocket science. You don't even have to go to school for this. Here is Jesus. And then they reject it. And you go, why? Why would somebody not believe in Jesus? It's pretty easy. Jesus is light. Light hurts. Have you ever been in darkness? for a good long time and then somebody turns on the light have you ever went like this if you haven't and you have a child you can do it to them tomorrow morning <laughs> flashlight is all you need right they're sleeping and just go right in front of their face they'll wince light can hurt light exposes who we are and the truth is that we have shame. All of us have shame. And in this moment, Jesus is saying that when he comes, he exposes our shame. He exposes our darkness. He exposes our wicked deeds. And the wicked darkness hates it. It's very simple. The wicked darkness, there is no truth. And the light brings their works, in verse 20, that it should be exposed. But then there's verse 22, or 21, and it starts with a different conjunction, the word but. Every time you see the word but in the Bible, you should know something really good is coming after that. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. But whoever does what is true now, what does this mean? Whoever does what is true. If you have followed along through last week and this week, through this dialogue, through this conversation, you already know what the answer is. Jesus hasn't left it ambi ambiguous. He has not hidden it under a basket. He actually has made it very, very clear because he said, you must be born again. You're like, how? And he's like, believe in me. Believe in me. Whoever does what is true. Now, I left a question unanswered at the beginning. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? We can have a knowledge of God. In fact, all of us have a knowledge of God. The entirety of the world has a knowledge of God because God said so. We look at creation and we know there's a God. We look at goodness and we know there's a God. We look at wickedness and we know there's a God. But is that enough? Jesus clearly said it's not. In fact, he even said you must believe in the name of the only Son of God, back in verse 18. You must believe in the name, a 
of Jesus. Now, the word name there has a, a meaning that's not just that you believe that the name exists. Everyone knows the name exists because you can say it. It's believing in the person. Believing in the authority of Jesus Christ. Believing in the works of Jesus Christ. So when we sit there and we see whoever does what is true, is Jesus true? Yes. Do we believe in him? Yes. But then Jesus says something so fascinating. And in fact, I actually think it's specifically for Nicodemus, a Pharisee. He says, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Carried out in God. This is an amazing thing because if you go through the Gospels, you know that Jesus and the Pharisees often butted heads. They did not have the easiest relationship. And one of the biggest issues that Jesus had with the Pharisees is he's like, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside's full of death. <laughs> Jesus had great ways. I mean, he was like the Shakespeare before Shakespeare of insults. Could you imagine hearing that? The Pharisees wanted and said, hey, here are my good works. And he, they would show them to the world. And Jesus is like, don't do that. But yet in this moment, in this don't do that, Jesus is doing something amazing. He's actually saying, what you want, your good works will be seen. But not because of you. There's another verse that is really fascinating. James chapter 2, verse 18. James chapter 2, verse 18. This is what James writes. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Now, doesn't that seem like this is exactly the conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus are having? Except for God just changes the entire perspective. Because look at the rest of the verse. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, why did I say that's a shift in perspective? Because the question was, some will say, faith or works? And God sits there, and he changes it. He changes it in such a fascinating way. He changes it in an amazing way. And look what that is. I will show you my faith, what? By my works. He actually looks at it and says, if you have faith, if you believe in Jesus, if you come to him, your works may be clearly seen. Why? Because they have been carried out in God. Jesus is, ask, is answering Nicodemus' fundamental question in the last verse. He has a fundamental question of, I want to go to God. I desire to be seen by him. I desire to be used by him. I desire something more in my life. And Jesus looks at him and says, you believe in me. You believe in Jesus Christ. He will use you. Your works are in him. Remember, this is the Lord that created you to work with him. You are blessed enough to not just believe in Jesus, and go on your way, but to go on your way and have a relationship and to be useful to the Lord. And how do we do that? We go back to John 3, 16. And I want to ask, invite us to say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This verse requires a response.